At the Pentagon, in one part of the building, there is planning for hostilities. In another, they are now pulling bodies from the debris. Tomorrow, the markets will open. Will America be as resolved with its dollars as it has been with its words? Planes, meanwhile, are flying over the country, about two-thirds the number that would fly on a normal Sunday, and Americans have gone to church all across the country as the faithful struggle to maintain their faith. As I say, we will cover all those stories, but we start tonight with the president. George W. Bush spent today at Camp David meeting with his national security advisors, the work at hand planning the next steps in the war he has promised to wage on those responsible for Tuesday's terrorist attacks. When he returned to the White House, he had words of reassurance for Americans, but also a sobering assessment of what may lie ahead. ABC's Terry Moran reports from the White House. The president returned from Camp David mid-afternoon. The first lady at his side, their dogs in tow, as if to project a picture of normal domestic life. And that's what Mr. Bush wanted to tell the country as he came home. Tomorrow, the good people of America go back to their shops, their fields, American factories, and go back to work. Our nation was horrified, but it's not going to be terrorized. And the president tried to buck up the morale of people who may be demoralized by the attacks by recalling his stirring visit to New York last Friday. If the American people had seen what I had seen in New York City, you'd have great faith, too. You'd have faith in the hard work of the rescuers. You'd have great faith because of the desire for people to, to do what's right for America. But the president acknowledged the terror of last Tuesday has changed the country. He now governs, as he said, a nation at war, and he signaled clearly today that means a change in law enforcement and possibly in civil liberties on the home front. We have to be on alert in America. We're a nation of law, a nation of civil right. We're also a nation under attack. And uh, the, the attorney general will address that in a way that I think will, the American people will understand. The Justice Department is seeking enhanced authority for law enforcement to conduct surveillance of suspects, among other new powers, as part of its response to the attacks. None of this will be short-term, as Vice President Cheney starkly admitted this morning. This is going to be a uh, struggle that the United States is going to be involved in for the foreseeable future. There's not going to be an end date when we're going to say, there, it's all over with. And a note for the history books. The president confirmed reports that in the uncertain hours of Tuesday morning as hijacked planes were hurtling out of the sky, he gave the order allowing U.S. combat aircraft to shoot down commercial jetliners if they did not respond. That didn't happen, Charlie. The president naturally called that decision difficult. He said, I never dreamed we would be under attack this way. ABC's Terry Moran at the White House. Well, neither the president nor his national security advisors will say exactly when, where, or how the first strikes of this new brand of war will occur, but the mobilization for this new kind of war is about to begin. ABC's John McQuethy reports from the Pentagon. The administration was out in force today using the Sunday talk shows to explain how different things must now be. The CIA and FBI have been operating with their hands tied, the vice president said. It's time to change some laws like those that prohibit paying informants who may also be criminals. If, if you're going to deal only with um, uh, sort of uh, officially approved, certified good guys, uh, you're not going to find out what the bad guys are doing. You need to be able to penetrate uh, these organizations. You need to have on the payroll some very unsavory characters. Others are lobbying for a change in policy first laid down by President Ford prohibiting political assassinations. Uh, and if that uh, means that we have to have the authority to assassinate people before they can assassinate us, uh, yes, we should uh, free that uh, stricture, and the President of the United States uh, can do it uh, at his will. That may become the job of U.S. commandos, who are expected to play a major role. We are now talking about the use of special forces intrusively to hunt down and kill terrorists, to use them to target terrorists for lethal strikes, which may be from aircraft, cruise missiles, or any other means. A more general bombing campaign aimed at crippling a terrorist organization has real limitations. The people we're dealing with have no armies or navies or air forces or battleships or carriers or capital cities even, uh, or high-value targets. 
While the terrorists may be hard to locate, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld says those who support them are not. They cannot function except with the tolerance of other countries, with, with countries, real states, uh, that do have capitals, that do have armies and nav navies, and, and do have high-value targets. The first real state that is being threatened by the U.S. is Afghanistan and its Taliban rulers who are providing Osama bin Laden with safe haven. They will have to make their choice whether they want to be in the receiving end of the full wrath of, uh, of the United States and others, or whether they want to get rid of this curse that they have within their country. As the administration prepares its strategy, they are beginning to realize to send American troops after terrorists could involve much higher risk for those American soldiers. There will be casualties, they are warning. Some soldiers will not come home, Charlie. All right, thanks. John McQuethy, who is at the Pentagon tonight. Well, just one day after agreeing to fully support President Bush's war on terrorism, Pakistan issued an ultimatum of its own to neighboring Afghanistan. It is in Afghanistan that the ruling Taliban militia has for years provided refuge to Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden has again denied involvement in Tuesday's attack, saying today that the operation, quote, appears to have been carried out by individuals with their own motivation. Tonight, ABC's Bob Woodruff reports from Islamabad. In a meeting with newspaper editors today, Pakistan's president, Pervez Musharraf, confirmed that a team of Pakistani diplomats will be meeting with Taliban leaders in Afghanistan tomorrow. Government sources tell ABC News they will demand that the Taliban expel Osama bin Laden within three days or face an eventual U.S. attack. In response, the Taliban's ambassador to Pakistan promised that bin Laden can stay until he decides to leave. It's not up to the host in the Afghan tradition to tell the guest to leave the house. It's up to the guest to leave the house or not. Today, the Taliban called for an emergency meeting of its top clerics to be held on Tuesday in Afghanistan's capital of Kabul, where they will discuss the defense of their country. Pakistan risks direct confrontation with the Taliban, who this weekend threatened invasion if Pakistan cooperates with the U.S. Inside Pakistan, small pockets of dissent are already emerging, mostly fundamentalist religious groups who oppose any involvement in attacking their neighbor. It is our belief that if America is going to attack Afghanistan, a holy war will be begun and everyone will be start to react against America and so many things will be happening in America just like happened in New York. Tonight, Pakistan's military is on high alert and the president has stepped up internal security in case supporters of the Taliban try to create unrest inside the country. Bob Woodruff, ABC News, Islamabad. And next we turn to the investigation, the search for those who did it. The scope of the investigation is huge. Investigators are trying to track down 100 people who they believe may have information about the hijackers. 25 people are under INS custody and two material witnesses have been arrested. ABC's Pierre Thomas has the latest. Sources tell ABC News the FBI believes these two men may have ties to the hijackers in last week's devastating attacks. Ayub Ali Khan and Mohammad Jaweed Mazmath were detained aboard an Amtrak train in Fort Worth, Texas, the day of the assault. According to law enforcement sources, they were carrying more than $20,000 in cash and box cutters, the same type of weapons used to take over and crash four commercial flights. The two men have been flown from Texas to New York City to face additional questioning by the FBI. Sources tell ABC News the two are likely to be arrested as material witnesses. Their detention is part of a broad effort to determine if more attacks were being planned and to locate those who supported the terrorist assaults. Today, Ashcroft said the attack made painfully clear there's a need for expanded law enforcement powers to stop terrorism. Among the new proposals, Roving wiretap authority, allowing the FBI to tap any telephone a suspect may use with a single court order. We need for our phone tap legislation to follow an individual so that no matter where an individual goes, we have the capacity to uh, develop the surveillance. ABC News has also learned the Bush administration will attempt to tighten immigration laws and will also seek millions of new funding for FBI counterterrorism efforts. Charlie.
All right, thanks very much, Pierre Thomas, at the FBI building in Washington. Next up, we take a look at the scene itself, the World Trade Center tower scene, at the enormous mound of rubble where the towers once stood. The searching and digging continues around the clock. The number of missing rose today to 5,097. 180 people are confirmed dead, their bodies found, including passengers who were aboard the two planes that crashed into the towers. ABC's Bill Blakemore has the latest from Ground Zero. The full extent of the wreckage, more than 10 city blocks, was clear for the first time from the skies today. Crawling all over it and through it, the firefighters, rescue workers, engineers were unrelenting in search and rescue for the more than 5,000 people now officially reported to be missing. Architects and rescue experts say there are hallways and passages at least in the many basement levels of the towers where people could still be alive. So they keep tunneling and keep dismantling carefully, sometimes with big machinery, but mostly by hundreds of pairs of hands that never stop grasping, reaching, carrying. You don't want to let go. If it's piece by piece, if it's bucket by bucket, or, or steel by steel, that's what it is. Hours, months, weeks before we get them all out. Whatever, whatever it, it takes. takes, whatever it takes, it how long it room. takes. The firefighters who lost more than 300 of their own are everybody's heroes. They're working 24-hour shifts, 24 off, then another 24 on, around the clock. Mayor Giuliani today promoted 168 firefighters to replace some of those missing, including the city's fire chief, who was killed in the disaster. Yes, they've taken some of our most precious lives, but they have not taken our spirit. They've removed nearly 30,000 tons of rubble so far, but that's out of 450,000 tons, all told. When the official number of missing rose above 5,000 today, for rescuers, it was just that many more, any one of whom might still be found alive. And Charlie, the rescuers really are taking those lessons from earthquakes around the world seriously. They know that survival under the wreckage for two weeks, even longer, is possible. So they're going to keep searching. Charlie? All right, Bill Blakemore at the site of the former site of the World Trade Center Towers. We're going to show you some pictures just a few blocks uptown from there. This is a picture of Union Square in Manhattan, which is normally a bustling, impersonal patch of green bordering 14th Street on the south and 17th Street on the north. On a normal Sunday morning, you'd find a farmer's market there. But it's taken on the appearance of a small town square since the events of Tuesday, with neighbors gathering to be together, behavior New Yorks are not normally known for. The patchwork of candles, flowers, artwork, and flags continues to serve as a round-the-clock memorial. And then going back downtown in New York, about five blocks from where the World Trade Center used to stand, the New York Stock Exchange has been preparing all weekend to reopen tomorrow morning. Last Tuesday's attacks did not damage the building that houses the Stock Exchange, but there is great concern that the economy, the stock market's fuel, may be facing significant casualties in the days ahead. So we turn to ABC's Bob Jamison. And Bob, I know today you talk to a lot of brokers, a lot of market analysts, a lot of economists, none of whom wanted to go on camera to talk about what may happen when the markets open. And I wonder, are they afraid that things are going to be so very difficult in the markets tomorrow, or do they just not know? Well, Charlie, it's partly the fear of the unknown. After all, the world and the American economy are much more uncertain now than they were when stocks were last traded on Monday. That's not good for the stock market. There's also concern about volatility. $400 billion in trades did not take place in the four days the stock market was closed. What Wall Street professionals are telling their clients this weekend is don't panic, hang in there, don't focus on tomorrow, focus on the long term, which is exactly what the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange hopes investors will do. Investors have had this time frame to step back and take a reasoned approach, take a thoughtful approach to uh, their investments. It has taken a massive around-the-clock effort to get Wall Street ready to trade again. A main Con Edison power station was destroyed at the World Trade Center. Because of water, Con Ed abandoned much of its underground cable system and installed new electric cables above ground. The collapse of a building adjacent to the Twin Towers destroyed a key telephone switching center. Thousands of workers have rerouted phones, 
and data lines used for half of all stock trading. 100,000 workers will converge on banks and brokerage houses as well as the stock exchange. With subways disrupted and roads closed, everything from private buses to a new ferry across the East River from Brooklyn will be used. It will not be business as usual, but the market will be open after its longest shutdown in history. I think it sends a strong signal uh, that they may have engaged in one of the most horrible criminal acts in the history of mankind, but we're going to rise above it, we're going to come back, and we're going to be ready. No matter the state of the phones and computers, tomorrow will be an emotionally difficult day on Wall Street. Before the opening bell, Charlie, there will be two minutes of silence. All right, thanks. Bob Jamison, who is down on Wall Street, an important symbol tomorrow to get the markets open. Now a look at the transportation system of America, specifically the airplanes and whether they're flying. Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta has ordered a complete review of security procedures for America's airlines and airports. Secretary Mineta asked outside experts to look at ways of keeping terrorists off of planes and out of the cockpit. ABC's Lisa Stark has a report. As tight as security is now at the nation's airports, it could get even tighter. A task force announced today will report back to the transportation secretary within two weeks on what additional security steps are necessary, both at the airports and on airplanes. What I expect now are the right answers in response to the dramatic events since Tuesday's crisis. On the table, armed military police at all major airports, strengthening and securing cockpit doors, limiting cargo hold access, and having the federal government take over all security screening at the airports. It's now the responsibility of the airlines. I think the national government should take it over and not leave it to the airlines because that's crazy. The task force includes airport, airline, and Boeing executives. A former FAA security chief claims airlines especially have fought tighter security in the past. We bloated that committee, in essence, with the enemy to good security practices. We don't need that. We need security expertise. But given Tuesday's terrorist attacks, the Department of Transportation and the airlines insist everything will be up for consideration and action. Every element of the, of the aviation system is being looked at step by step uh, with respect to the security measures that, uh, that should be taken. Now, one key security measure remains in place, the closure of Reagan National Airport near the heart of Washington. You can see it is deserted. No word on when this airport uh, might reopen and under what conditions. The FAA today did relax one of its security measures. Airlines, if they want to, can now accept mail, cargo, and parcels. Now, right about now, there are some 4,000 flights in the air. That's commercial, general aviation, and military. That's about 60% of what you would expect at this time on a Sunday. The airlines will be adding even more flights tomorrow. Charlie? All right, thanks. Lisa started a deserted national airport in Washington. So how did Americans person by person deal with this? Well, on this first Sunday since the attack on the Twin Towers, millions of Americans sought comfort where they worship. ABC's Dan Harris is standing by at St. Patrick's Cathedral on New York's Fifth Avenue, where there's a service underway. Charlie, there are thousands of people inside St. Patrick's Cathedral and thousands more outside listening through loudspeakers. Inside, Edward Cardinal Egan is celebrating a special mass for the victims of Tuesday's terror attacks. He's talking about the need for faith in these trying times and the crucial difference between seeking justice and seeking vengeance. These are themes we heard echoes at churches heard echoed at churches across the country today. From Los Angeles to Dallas to Chicago, churches focused on God and country. They were waving American flags at services overseas as well, in Italy, in Cambodia. And at the American Church in London. Some sermons gave voice to our anger. But this was not an accident. This was an intentional, malicious act perpetrated against humanity by humanity. How low can we fall? However, many religious leaders told their flocks this is a time for sorrow, not hate. At the Crystal Cathedral in Los Angeles, a local Muslim leader was invited to speak to the congregation. 
I came here on behalf of the positive believers and the Islamic faith to share the sorrow, the pain, and the anguish with our brothers and sisters in the Christian faith. The call for forgiveness was perhaps most eloquently articulated at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. We must not allow ourselves to become the evil we deplore. At a time like this, some might be tempted to question their faith. What we saw today, however, is that many Americans are actually turning to religion right now, if not for answers, at least for some comfort. Charlie? All right, thanks. Dan Harris at St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue here in New York. So just what happened at the World Trade Center Towers on Tuesday? As detailed in today's New York Times, a look at just who occupied those twin towers and just where people may have died. In these haunting vistas, it is almost impossible to imagine that these shards of steel and small pieces of concrete were once the jewel of the New York skyline, the Twin Towers, each with 110 floors. In the North Tower, the site of the first attack, at least 100 people, in some cases many more, are missing from every floor, from the 93rd through the 107th. At the very top, the famous windows of the World Restaurant, 305 people are believed to have been there Tuesday morning. None have been heard from. All are missing. Just below were the bond traders, Cantor Fitzgerald, the 101st floor, and up. 650 of their 1,000 employees are missing. Robert Sleewak worked for Cantor and called home after the blast. His sister, Pat. His wife received a call from him that he heard a bang, and then there was smoke all over, and then they got disconnected. Just a few floors down from Cantor was the financial insurance firm, Marsh & McLennan. They had 1,700 employees, 300 are missing. Oh my God, there it goes! Out of here. Most of the people who escaped, it seems, escaped from the lower floors. In number two World Trade Center, the largest numbers of missing are again from the top, just above the floors where the jetliner came crashing in. Again, at least 100 are missing from every floor, from the 98th to the 105th. Sandler O'Neill and Partners, a firm which deals in bank stocks, were on the 104th floor above that fire. 70 employees are missing, yet miraculously, 16 managed to get out of the building. In the South Tower, as in the North, a sobering fact in this age of so many skyscrapers in so many cities, the higher a person may have been, the greater the chance that he or she is now missing. And how did the government react on Tuesday? Well, today we heard first-person accounts of the September 11th disaster from Vice President Dick Cheney and Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Here's ABC's Barry Serafin. Cheney was in his White House office Tuesday morning watching, like many other Americans, the horror unfold in New York. Today, he described how Secret Service agents burst into his office. They uh, came in and said, sir, we have to leave immediately, and grabbed me and... And, uh, and literally grabbed you and moved you. Yeah. And uh, they were, uh, you know, your feet touched the floor periodically, but uh, they're bigger than I am, and they hoisted me up and moved me very rapidly down the hallways into an underground facility. They did that because uh, they'd received a report that an airplane was headed for the White House. The rest of the White House was evacuated soon afterward. At 9.25 a.m., the nation's military air defense command was notified by the FAA that a hijacked airliner was headed toward Washington. Two F-16 fighter jets were scrambled at Virginia's Langley Air Force Base, 130 miles from the Capitol. But the warning was not passed on to the Pentagon. The jets were in the air by 9.35, but it was too late. Just three minutes later, the hijacked plane, American Airlines Flight 77, smashed into the Pentagon. I was in the Pentagon and felt the shock of the attack. And What did you uh, think it was? A bomb. I uh, had no idea. I looked out the window and, and then went outside and saw the uh, devastation and talked to an eyewitness who told me that, that he had seen a, an aircraft plow into the uh, Pentagon between the first and second floor. Even if the Pentagon had received word of the hijacked plane headed this way, it would have had only 13 minutes to react. Not enough time to avert disaster. Barry Sarup and ABC News at the Pentagon. 
And finally in this broadcast, among the millions of Americans stunned by Tuesday's attack are people accustomed to covering others' grief, not necessarily experiencing it for themselves. The attack on America through the lens of the men and women trying to cover it in tonight's reporter's notebook. Take two. Take two and two, one. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now, raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. And all of a sudden, the South Tower just let loose. It just let loose. And it's just like a Hollywood film. It all happens in slow motion. But you know you have only a matter of seconds to get out of there alive. The only reason that I'm alive, the only reason that I'm here, is that there was a door. There was a, a door to a building that we could run into. We don't know what's happening. And then we saw the people jumping. We saw what we thought was debris, and we realized it was people jumping. That was it. She couldn't, she couldn't finish the interview. She just, she lost it. She lost it, and I lost it. And, you know, it's not my style to, to hug people on television. And, and we were just out there alone. It was Kathy, it was me, it was a cameraman. We hugged each other and didn't let go. Yeah, is this the spot where we got some guys? I can only tell you that the pictures, the pictures can't capture it. The pictures are, are, are either a frozen moment in time or only as wide as the lens can go. And when you are there surrounded by it, the smell of it, the sound of it, the enormity of it, uh, there aren't words, at least I don't have them, to tell you what it feels like to be there. Oh, God, please pray. As I'm going home, it's near the armory on East 27th Street, East 26th Street. I see a lot of the uh, f uh, members of friends and family members have hung up various photos of their loved ones uh, from the World Trade Center. And, and I'm overwhelmed by it. I, I just break into tears. I, <laughs> these are, are, are people that I never knew personally, but they're, they're loved ones. And I, I just get very upset about it. I don't know them, but I just can't imagine no one coming home to see their fathers and their daughters. And I'm still upset. We do not walk in fear. There's no distance. You can't. You, you know, there are some stories you can't cover if you want to put yourself at a distance. Some stories you can only cover if you let the people you're talking to make you cry. Or, are you missing the story? We are not afraid. And that is our report for tonight. We hope you had a chance to get a break this weekend and get some perspective for the week ahead. I'm Charles Gibson. Good night. The ABC Television Network extends its thoughts and prayers to those who've suffered so much in this national tragedy. We stand steadfast with all Americans, united in hope and courage. This is ABC. Call for action. It's one way Action News is taking action for you. The wonderful